Hey church, as many of you know, in January, we switched our church over to a fiscal budget year. We set that budget to $2,314,482. And to date, we have received $2,030,989.95. I want to extend my heartfelt appreciation to each and every one of you. Together as a church, we have accomplished remarkable things, touching lives and making a difference in our community like never before. As we come to the end of our fiscal year, which ends on June 30th, we still need to close out the difference in our budget. That number that we need to close out is $283,492.05. Every contribution matters. If each one of us decides to give according to our means, we will easily bridge that gap and ensure that our mission and our ministry continue to thrive in this coming year. Giving is not solely about finances. It is an act of worship, just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So today I ask each of you to prayfully consider how you can contribute to closing the budget gap during these final days of the fiscal year. Whether it's a one-time gift or an increase in your regular giving, every act of generosity will make a significant impact. Together, I know we can close out this budget year stronger than ever before. The Bible is a tough read. It's complex, cryptic, and confusing. Even if you know some of the stories, how do they all fit together? How does the average person make sense of this ancient book? And what does it have to do with us? Good to see you guys. And uh, today we're going to wrap up this series that we've been in called Four Short Words. Where we've been talking about um, essentially this, this sort of uh, simple way to understand and make sense of the Bible because it can be very complicated and confusing. And uh, we began um, at the very beginning with Genesis and we have been sort of working our way forward Um, through these four movements, and today is the fourth, and uh, I want to encourage you to take some notes, and also, uh, maybe you haven't been here uh, through the whole series, or maybe you've missed uh, something here or there, to go back and catch yourself up, to listen online, or to grab a YouTube video, podcast, whatever it is that uh, works best with you and your schedule this summer, um, to catch up and understand these movements. I think understanding Scripture is so core to our relationship with God and what it means to be a person of faith. And so um, hopefully this has been helpful to you. And then next week we're going to jumpstart something brand new, uh, which I'm very excited about. Um, But uh, I want to encourage you, scribble some notes today or write legibly. Choice is yours. Uh, But the title of my message either way is Rerouting. Rerouting. Um, And man, I... How many of you have gotten to a place now where you cannot imagine life without the Maps app in your phone? Is anybody else there at this point? I remember, like, I am old enough to where I remember life before all of that, right? I remember when uh, MapQuest was the best we could do, you know, where you would, you would type it into your home computer and print out the how to get somewhere and then highlight it. And then t- does anybody remember this? This was a, a season. Um, and then even before that, before we even had that, it was like your dad would just draw a weird map on a napkin or something and give it to you. And you're like, I don't understand what any of this is. You know what I mean? Left at the oak tree. What does that even mean? What oak tree? Which oak tree? What are we talking about? It's 40 miles out, too. I don't know. How am I going to know? Um, there's so many different ways that like that technology has evolved and evolved how we get places. And I used to be able to, to get places when I first started driving. Someone could explain things, and I kind of knew how the city I lived in was laid out. Now I, I can't get anywhere. I don't know. I'm, I'm like, I, like, I cannot function without the Maps app in my phone. Like, I don't know how to do anything. People will be like, hey, just come on by. We actually, we live like two blocks from you. I'm like, just give me the address. I'll punch it in. 
I can't, no, you don't need that. Just you go out your street and then over to, and I'm like, it's too much. That's too much already. I lost you. I tuned out in the middle of that. I don't know, okay? I need step by step. And the thing that's, that's the, the biggest advancement, right, in GPS technology is the fact of that little thing that happens. Because I do this a lot where you take a wrong turn, you get lost, you get turned around, something happens, and it does that little thing where it pulls up the little rerouting, right? And um, I both am like angry and grateful in that moment because it means I've done something stupid and uh, it's going to take me longer to get where I'm going. But also that it has my back. Like right away, it's just like we will help you f figure out where to go from here. If you have just a regular map or just like, you know, in your head, you're just trying to remember how to get someplace and you take wrong directions. Back when I was in high school, it was like, I guess I'm just going to live on this farm now. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> I don't know how to get anywhere, especially if it was late at night and no place was open to stop and ask for directions. You're like, I, I don't know what to do. I guess just sleep in my car till daybreak. You know, it was like, you didn't really have a lot of options. Um, and it's insane to think about this thing that we didn't have before, even in my lifetime, has become so essential to the way I live every single day. I, I can't comprehend uh, my existence without it, even though I lived a period of my existence without it. And um, there are so many different ways that technology has sort of leapt forward. If you look at back through history and the history of trying to get places, uh, there were maps at the very beginning, and that was great, but it's, maps are very static and, and generic. In other words, you're going to have to sort of like read it and interpret how to get where you want to go, figure it out yourself, wrestle through it, uh, through the pictures. Hopefully you can figure out which is north and south, and you're going to figure out how to get where you want to go. A guide is a little bit better, right? If you have somebody that's, that's with you, that's sitting next to you, that can jot out things, that knows your, your personality, how well you get lost. Uh, but that has its limitations, right? Because uh, if you, even if you had somebody that could ride along with you and give you promptings and directions, uh, let's say that you have somebody in your family who's amazing with directions, and they ride along with you, like, turn here, turn here, okay, do that, whatever. That's great but you can't really take them with you everywhere you go. You can't call them everywhere, every time you need to get somewhere. Imagine if that was the relationship that you had with somebody, right? Where just like, hey, I need to go, um, I need to go somewhere. Are you free for the next hour? Just to, uh, I could pick you up, you could tell me how to get there every step of the way. Like that seems absurd. And you could do that without their permission, but that's called kidnapping. And that is frowned upon. And then there's GPS technology, right, which is, it's better than something that is specific and relational. It's dynamic and contextual, right? So uh, your Maps app or any sort of GPS device, it knows where you are already. You tell it where you want to go, and it gives you the best way to get there. And it factors in all the contextual information that a static map or maybe even a guide wouldn't even have access to, right? It's going to tell you, uh, okay, based on weather, based on traffic patterns, based on this accident that's up ahead, uh, you know, you need to do this. It'll even tell you, like, based on if you're going to walk it, this is what I do. If you're going to, if you're going to drive it, if you're going to ride a bike, right? If you're going to steal a car and drive that, you could do this. There are so many different options they're creating now. I actually think that one's a bad one. I don't think they should in, have included that in the recent update. But it's, it's super helpful. And again, it, it will reroute you if you get lost or, or make a wrong turn. Now, some of you are just like, yeah, I, I, I have a GPS. I know how it works. So thank you for the sales pitch. What does this have to do with anything? And uh, I don't remember. It's been a long weekend. So <laughs> let's close in prayer. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I think when you look at, at these sort of movements right here, map guide, GPS, and, and what they sort of indicate, in a lot of ways, this is a great roadmap for uh, sort of the different movements of the story of God and, and, and of how Scripture is actually structured. Um, you know, the first two chapters of Genesis are really this of period. And this is sort of the starting place that we have, right? Um, this is the place where we realize this is where, we, you know, you can't figure out where you want to go if you don't know where you're coming from, where you're starting from. And that's sort of what of is. Between this sort of next phase uh, that we talked about on week two 
is the rest of the Old Testament. And it kind of functions like a, like a Thomas guide or like a book of, of printable maps where you're looking at it. It's, it's the law. It is the prophets. And it is sort of directing you on here's a, a bunch of sort of static and generic information that you're going to have to like contextualize in your own life and adapt and figure out how that stuff is going to work. Then we get to the New Testament in the Gospels, and it's almost like having a, a big brother ride shotgun, tell you what to, where to go, like step by step. It's this with dynamic where God becomes a, a human person and comes to earth and is with us and among us and prompting us every step of the way. And if you look throughout Scripture, as you get through towards the very end of the Gospels where um, Jesus dies and raises again, um, even before that period of time, when he's just in and with them, the, the early followers of Jesus just thought, man, God with you, across the table from you, alongside you, walking down a road with you, that is as good as it gets. And at the point in history, uh, biblical history, in the early New Testament, it, that really was as good as it could possibly get. But what was weird about that was Jesus kept telling his followers that, listen, don't get too attached to me because I'm not going to be here forever. Like the, my time on earth and this dynamic that we have is very, very limited. And one day it's going to be no more. In fact, he kept telling them that he had to go away because when he left and the dynamic between them changed, he would send someone else behind him. And that was going to change things even more. And none of this made any sense to them. They were just like, we don't get it. And there's a lot of examples of Jesus talking this really cryptic way and his disciples just being like, uh-huh, yeah, we don't, I don't, we don't understand, right? Faking like they understand, but not really. And there's so many examples of this. I'm just going to give you one this morning. This is in John chapter 14, verse 1. These are the kind of conversations Jesus had around tables with his disciples. This is where he starts. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also in me. And the disciples were like, okay, got it. Like, because you were God in human form. So if we trust God, we should trust you because you're basically one in the same. We're tracking so far. This is awesome. We feel good about ourselves. And then Jesus says this next. This is verse two. He says, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when everything is ready, I will come and get you. So you will always be with me where I am. Now imagine that this is a real conversation that you were having with a real person, because that's what it was for these people. And they're like, okay, wait. So God is your dad, and you are going to where he is to remodel some rooms. <laughs> but then after that, you're going to come back and uh, get a, okay, hold on. Is this, are you actually leaving or is this a metaphor? Okay. Uh, is this something you're really going to do, or is this a representation of something that you like you're going to do in like a spiritual sense, but not necessarily like a physical. Like we're a little bit confused because here's the reality. You are technically a carpenter. And so you going to remodel some houses <laughs> is well within the realm of possibility. Okay, but you also use a lot of metaphors. And so it can, maybe it's just that. And so we're starting to lose you a little bit, but maybe we'll catch on as it keeps going forward. Then he says this, verse four. And you know the way to where I'm going. And immediately one of the disciples says, no, we don't know. We have no idea where you're going. <laughs> I love this because it's like he's talking and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's, there's one guy who's like, I don't get it. Do you guys get it? <laughs> you ever been this person like in a conversation or like a class or something? And, and you, you're like, I am so lost right now. And you're looking around and everyone's like, mm -hmm, yeah. And they're like writing notes. And you're like, am I stupid? I might be the stupidest person. And then he looks over, and like you always have that one friend that's like across the way, you know, and they sort of look over and they're like, <laughs> and he's like, oh, maybe you should say something, you know? And he's like, we don't know. We don't, I can't speak for everyone, but I, what are you talking about? We have no idea what is happening right now. We don't know what you're talking about, we don't know where you're going. And the hilarious part of this is Jesus doesn't really answer them. He just keeps on going, talking in riddles. Verse 12, he says this. 
I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater because I am going to be with the Father. What are you talking about? Like, okay, so I, we thought you were God in like a, a human form. And so how is anybody going to be able to like be more effective or do greater things or be more accomplished than God in a human body? That doesn't even make any sense. Now we feel like we're, we're super lost. And Jesus is like, don't worry, I'm going to keep talking. And so verse 19, he says this, soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. You will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And again, I just, we read through stuff in the Bible, and we're like, yeah, that's the Bible. I think, again, think, imagine that you were at this table in this conversation, you're like, <laughs> okay, what is happening? Let me just recap what I'm hearing from you, okay? Because I learned this in, in therapy from listening. And so let me just mirror back to you, Jesus. You're leaving and you're coming back. But you're also going to be here during. But not really, because there's another you that's not really you, that's also invisible, and it's going to be inside us. So when you're with your dad, who's also kind of here at the same time, but somewhere else too, because he's doing a construction project <laughs> and he needs your help. But it's not going to take forever because you're going to come back. And when we get to see the remote, we don't get it. We don't know what you're saying. Okay? We're so confused. Am I the weird one? Am I the Do you guys? You in the front row. Okay? You're taking so many notes right now. It seems like you know what's going on. Well, you explain it. And he's like, well, I don't. If you guys can't understand it, I can't explain it to you. He doesn't know either. He doesn't know either. He just wants me to look stupid in front of the class. And this is what I think is so interesting is like, a lot of times when we read through stuff, we look down on the disciples because they don't understand what Jesus is saying. We're like, man, they're so dumb. But if you had a really smart friend who started saying stuff like Jesus is saying, you'd be like, they're having a stroke. They're having a stroke. <laughs> Something is wrong. We need to get this person to the hospital, okay? I don't know what they're talking about anymore. Nothing they're saying makes any sense. And the reason why it doesn't really make any sense to these people Yes, it's sort of codified and cryptic a little bit, but also at the base of it, Jesus is trying to describe how something works that doesn't exist yet. Like at this point in the Gospels, he's just like, so this is how this is going to be. And they're just like, yeah, we don't even know what that is. It's almost impossible to do. It'd be like trying to explain GPS to someone in 1952. Imagine taking a time machine. And just going and sitting down at this, this table. I just meant, listen, here's the way it's going to work. Eventually, you're going to be able to get every map ever on a pocket TV connected to computers all around the world through invisible space beams. <laughs> now, track with me. Um, you're just going to put it on your dashboard, and the robot lady voice is going to tell you <laughs> when to turn and where to turn. And, you know, she'll even let you know if it's going to take like a little bit longer because there's an accident or something happening, which is really great, but also kind of annoying sometimes because she will interrupt the podcast you're listening to about the Kardashians. <laughs> like, imagine the look on their faces. They, they would be like, okay, I feel like you're speaking English, but so much of what you're saying makes no sense to me right now. I'm really trying. They would look at you like the disciples looked at Jesus. And the reason is because, you know, through Jesus... God was, for the first time, flesh and bone, which radically uh, evolved humanity's relationship with God. But the issue with this is that Jesus' very limbs and ligaments actually limited him. In human form, Jesus could only really be with who he was with. You see, his followers were going to need the thing he was talking about that they couldn't comprehend. They were going to need something more than God in human form for the same reason that my kids are better off when they start driving with a dynamic GPS app than their dad sitting shotgun spewing directions. And this is the reason. Because I have three kids and there is one of me. Right? And, and, and they all need to go different places. And most of the time, at least at this stage of their life, most of the time they want to go all different places all at the same exact time. And I can't be in all those places at once. And I, I don't know if you guys know this, but God has way more kids than me. 
There's like 8 billion of us right now and only one Jesus. Even if you're not good at math, you're like, that's not good odds. That's going to be difficult. And we're all starting in different places in our lives. And we're all moving in different directions. And we're all bumping into different obstacles and things that can threaten to derail what we originally had in mind or what we thought our life was going to be about or what we thought we were supposed to do in a particular moment. The reality of it is, this is why we need God, need a relationship with God, and also why a relationship with God is so complex. Because we need dynamic answers to complex questions because our lives and relationships and technology and culture are constantly changing. They're constantly evolving. Each of us need custom maps for our context. In other words, we need specific guidance, not just generic wisdom. And you have felt this frustration before when you are really wrestling with something in your life and someone sits down to help you and they give you a generic piece of wisdom. And you're like, yeah, but what, do I, what am I supposed to do in this situation? And they're just like, yes, yeah, so you just got to love people. And you're like, what does that mean? And they're like, I mean, what does it mean? And you're like, you know what? This is not going to be helpful. I should not have called you. It's frustrating. We want... We, we need to know specific things, like, is this an opportunity that I should pursue or ignore? This specific thing in front of me. Is, is, is this a skill that I should be attempting to develop in this season? Or is it sort of ridiculous and frivolous for me to go after this right now? Is this a relationship that I should invest my limited time in during this really busy season of life? Is this a moment where I should take a stand boldly? Or humbly step aside. What am I supposed to do right now? And we could go on and on, right? Like our questions for God are truly infinite. And when Jesus had cryptic conversations about going away, sending somebody else in his place, and I cannot overstate how many times he did this. He did this a lot. He was ultimately pointing to another shift in the story of God and us. Because on the other side of the Gospels, The rest of the New Testament is the story, it moves from the story of God being with us through Jesus to being in us through the Holy Spirit. You know, after Jesus came back to life, he assembles a bunch of his followers on the side of this mountain and he's going to make this big announcement and you can only uh, assume like what they thought he was going to say. Like, man, this is insane. He's back. He's going to, he's going to tell us that he is He is going to set up his kingdom, and he is going to take political power. He's going to set up uh, his his sort of domain here on earth, and we're going to get to rule alongside him, and nobody's going to be able to touch him. What are they going to be able to do? They already killed him, and he came back to life. Like, what other moves do they have? There's nothing that they can do. And also, why would he come back if he wasn't going to stay? That doesn't make any sense. I'm back! I also, I, I need to go. Um, he wouldn't do that. But that is exactly what he does. And instead, he, he tells them this. Instead of all the things they hoped that he would say, he says in Acts chapter 1, right before he ascends, he says, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. And then after he says this, he leaves. Or more specifically, he floats up into the air like a helium balloon, which we do not have time to go into and unpack right now. It's wild. And so all these people are kind of like, what, what do we do? And they're like, maybe we should do what he said. So they go into the city and they, they huddle together in this upper room and they talk and then they pray for whatever is supposed to happen because they don't really completely understand what is going to happen. Even though he's explained it, he's explained something that hasn't really existed and so they don't really know uh, what to expect or what they're supposed to, like, how they're going to even know what's going to happen. And anytime they asked Jesus, he was like, oh, you'll know. You'll know. And then this really weird thing happens. Acts chapter 2, verse 2 says this. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like a roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then what looked like flames settled on each of them, and everyone was filled 
with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages. And at the time, there were devout Jews from every nation in Jerusalem there. And when they heard the noise, everyone came running. And then Peter stepped forward and shouted at the crowd, Listen! And then he preaches this whole sermon. And all of these people decide to follow Christ from all over the world because they're all in town for uh, an extended period of time for this Jewish festival that they're celebrating. And this day becomes known in, in uh, religious history as the day of Pentecost. It marks the beginning of a new chapter of sort of this, this fourth movement of the story of God and us. God moves from being with us through Jesus to dwelling in us through the Holy Spirit. And he empowers these people. In fact, uh, this thing that Jesus said, like, you're going to do greater things than even me, this comes true on day one. Because historically, more people make the decision to follow Jesus. More people, as we say in our context, said yes to Jesus on this one day than in the entire three years that God himself in human form was walking around teaching and preaching. That's incredible. You look at that, and it's like clearly something has changed. And the changes are observable, right? They are tangible. They're objective. If you begin to look at what happens in the pages following this moment in time, you see a radical change in the way the disciples behave, the kinds of people that they are. The same disciples who often misunderstood the teachings of Jesus are now expounding on those exact teachings to thousands of other people with incredible clarity and insight. The disciples who once argued over who was going to be first in heaven and who got to sit by Jesus— I mean, childish and immature. Now they're the first to give everything they have to anyone in need that's around them. That's a massive shift. The same disciples who watched Jesus die for the world while they were hiding now boldly laid down their own lives publicly for the sake of his gospel. In other words, Christ's followers were wiser and bolder and more selfless and generous and more humble and sacrificial now that the Spirit was in them than they were the whole time Jesus was with them. Which is incredibly profound. And anyone observing them could see how much more loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled these people were that they knew. And outsiders couldn't help but observe this new movement and be like, what is happening? How is this happening? Why are these people so quickly evolving and becoming better versions of themselves? Like, what can we credit it to? And the apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. He says it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, now lives in you. In other words, all of that power and insight and authority, we now have access to as followers of Jesus, not as something we grasp for on the outside, but something that actually rests within us on the inside. Like, in other words, through the Holy Spirit, you're no longer dependent on your own power, perspective, will, or wisdom. Everything Jesus had access to is now in you. And this is something new. At this point in history, when this happens, nobody had access to this before. And we take this for granted now, because if you have grown up in church, and if you have been around Christians for any point in time, we all, everything we're doing exists after this came into being. And so it's difficult to remember what it was like before. It's like trying to explain to my kids that the internet didn't always exist. And they're like, what? You can just watch a show whenever you wanted to. Why? Because it wasn't on. Well, why didn't you just like go to the app? There weren't any apps. Well, then how did your device work? There were no devices. How did you use the internet? The internet wasn't invented yet. Why didn't someone create it? Because we didn't know about it. 
We didn't even know it was possible. We watched sci-fi movies and we're like, that is dumb, that will never happen. <laughs> and they're like, people are dumb, it's everywhere now. It's like they can't wrap their mind around it. But now we live in a time in which we do have access to the Holy Spirit, this sort of internal GPS that didn't and wasn't available to people before. Now, now church people say things like, um, you know, have you, have you invited Jesus into your heart? Do you have Jesus in your heart? And that doesn't seem like a weird thing to us. But here's what's interesting. There is no account in the Bible of anyone inviting Jesus into their heart. There are lots of examples of people inviting Jesus into their homes, into their synagogues, into their discussions, into their conversations and debates, but not into their hearts. And there is a real good reason for that. Okay, brace yourselves. A full-size human man cannot fit inside of someone's heart. Okay, that's just basic science. I mean, not without a shrink ray. But then at that point, all you're really getting is tiny Jesus, not full power Jesus. And nobody wants that. You don't want that. You don't know if shrinking him is going to shrink his powers. It's just like a whole thing that, again, we don't have time to get into. So then why do, why do people say that? Why do people ask if we've invited Jesus into our heart or tell us that we need to, you know, uh, you know, hold Jesus in our heart or bring Jesus into our heart? And the reason for this is because when we surrender our lives to Christ and we commit to follow the example of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to rest in us, making our heart his home. God takes up residence in the decision-making core of our lives and sort of becomes this internal GPS. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit from the inside comforts us and counsels us and convicts us and connects us to him and each other and gives us confidence. And what is so profound that, that sometimes if you've grown up in church, you take for granted is that uh, what, what the scripture is telling us at this point is instead of looking on the outside and, and begging for something out here, that, that when we invite Christ to come into our being, that he dwells within here. And now instead of asking questions out here, we begin to ask questions into here. And we're not asking questions of ourselves. We're asking questions of God's spirit who dwells within us. And this radically changes how life works. And the reason why God gives us access to all of these things is not just so that, you know, we can make a lot of money and get famous and make other people jealous on Instagram and, you know, have, have really, really good self-esteem, you know. That, that, that's not the goal. In fact, these are shallow American goals, not not God's kingdom goals. God empowers us through the Holy Spirit in these specific ways for something bigger than our own individual happiness. This is actually the goal that Jesus gives. He's like, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And this is, he's going to do all these incredible things from within you. And there's a reason for that. There's a purpose for that. And this is what he outlines before he floats up and disappears. He says this in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all the commands I gave you, which if you're counting is really only two. Love God and love people. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In other words, what he's saying here is, God wants to leverage everything he put in you to build something bigger than you. And so if you are trying to tap into everything God has given you for selfish reasons, you'll find yourself sort of sputtering out because that's not really why it's there. And using what God has given you or who God has made you to just like serve you, it, it sort of sputters. And then he promises that he will be with you by being in you through the Holy Spirit. But this thing that we're supposed to be doing that is bigger than us, that's making the world a better place, that actually God reveals, Jesus reveals to us in his teachings is, is really about like submitting ourselves to Christ, using everything that he's given us through the Holy Spirit and crafting the world back to a garden-like existence. 
to the place in which we are of. But it's not something we're supposed to do alone. In fact, all through the rest of the New Testament, after this, this moment on the day of Pentecost, the church takes on a new nickname. We, we begin to be called the body of Christ. And the idea is that God gives us strengths and abilities that become supernaturally charged by the Holy Spirit. That he takes all the, the particularities of our personality and he points them toward his purposes. And we end up becoming more of who we were always meant to be. Which, and this is so counter to the way that we think now in our culture, which doesn't usually end up making us more balanced people. In fact, it ends up often making us the opposite. We become more imbalanced with the Holy Spirit moving on our lives in the area of our strengths, and we become simultaneously more aware of our need for interconnectedness with others to compensate for our weaknesses. We realize when we are tapped into life alongside the Holy Spirit that we can't do everything by ourselves. That in fact, we will never be our true or best selves without relying on others who rely on God. That we are an interlocking body of people. In other words, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is fully available to every follower of Jesus equally, but not identically. Like, think about it this way. If you are, let's say you are a tongue in the body of Christ. Go with me on this, okay? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, when he comes into your life, wants to supercharge who he has made you to be already. And so if you are a tongue, the Holy Spirit wants to empower you to taste better, to taste better than you have ever tasted before, as well as you possibly can, and to gift all of that information of taste to the rest of your body in a way that benefits the whole of who you are. And the whole of who you are is interconnected with all of these other people that need the strength that only you can provide. It's not likely that the Holy Spirit, if you are a tongue in the body of Christ, is going to empower you to tie shoes or do karate real good. Although I do want to see a cartoon where a tongue does karate and Pixar, if you're out there listening. It's like we look at that stuff and we're like, that is a job for a different part. And this is what we don't understand in our culture, in our context. We think that we need to have it all and do it all and be it all, all by ourselves. This is anti Christ. That's not the way in which we are designed to live and be and operate. So how do you figure out what you are supposed to do? How do you figure out what God made you for? Like what strengths you lean into? I would recommend just as a starter kit to, to simply try this, to ask those that you are close to um, what the best things are about you. Maybe these are skills or traits or perspectives that you bring to the table that are almost like built in and inherent. And then brainstorm together how that you could aim each of those things in God's direction. The reality of it is, God is not interested in transforming you into a completely different person. He's interested in making you into the best version of you because he already created you to be the type of person that he wanted you to be. There's not an, uh, an issue where God is like, oh, really messed up on you. How can we make you completely different? In fact, all of the things that are most frustrating and annoying about you, whether those are the things you're annoyed about or other people are annoyed about, they are strengths aimed in the wrong direction. And this is what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do, to develop those things and to point them in God's direction, in the direction of becoming more like Jesus. And this is what is brilliant about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit essentially from the inside directs us to make decisions like Jesus would make decisions. And constantly as we are moving forward, the Holy Spirit reroutes us and redirects us in moments where we get confused, where we get lost, where we have no idea what we're doing. The Holy Spirit enables us to lean into the things that he has made us to do and know how to utilize those things, not just to make ourselves better, but to make everyone around us better, to build the body of Christ that is the church and to ultimately bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And I just wonder, like, what if we all did this thing? 
what if we leveraged everything that God had put in us to bring heaven to earth in our corner of the earth? What if we trusted God's spirit in us to show us how to live like Jesus moment to moment? What if we lived with this, an aware, uh, this awareness that God isn't somewhere out there, elsewhere, that God is right here in us? That when you most need access to God, to his comfort, to his counsel, to a sense of connection, to access to confidence that all that stuff is within you. Not inherently because of you, but because when you open your heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit enters in and gives you access to everything that you need to be the best you. And Jesus believed that if we all leaned into this reality, that this is how we return to the garden. This is how we have a sense of connectedness to him and creation. This is the way we redeem and restore everything that feels so broken. And this is why Jesus is like, I gotta go. But trust me, what I'm going to send in my place is so much better. And if you've not really opened your heart and your mind to that so much better, I hope that today is a day in which you do. Would you bow your heads with me across this room? I wanna just pray uh, this into your life today that this reality would become so real to you. God, we are so grateful for your love, your grace, your mercy in each of our lives. We're grateful for the way in which you tell us what we are of, that you map the in-between even when we push away from you or get caught up in self-centered sin patterns that, that push us from your plan for our lives. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who really is you in human form, who came to be among us, to live life alongside of us. And we are so grateful that with your death on the cross, your resurrection, that you closed the gap that existed between us and you and gave us access to something new, your spirit, which can come to rest inside of each of us. God, may that be our, our focus, our fixation, to invite your spirit into the interior of our heart and mind, to set up a home inside of us where you dwell. And God, to tap into everything that Jesus had access to when he was here. God, may we become aware that it exists within us through your spirit. Make us more confident, make us more competent, make us more comfortable with who you have made us to be. Give us guidance, give us perspective, give us strength, give us supernatural power to be everything you made us to be so that we can be a part of making your body and your world better. It's in Jesus' name we pray.